to see everybody. You make my heart feel good. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 22. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 22. 1 Corinthians 16, 22 says, If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Uh, and then the, the word maratha, or mar maranthia, I guess. I don't know, but I know what it means. It means it's an Aramaic word. It means our Lord is coming, or O oh Lord, come. And so it's, it's, this is pretty sharp. It's pretty plain words from the Apostle Paul. If a person does not love Jesus Christ, Paul says, then let them be cut off when Jesus comes. That's what he's saying. If we do not have the love for our Lord, we are to be accursed. And when Jesus comes back, he will carry out that curse. And these are pretty strong words, aren't they? But they are true words. And what, what would make Paul want to write this? I, I often look at this and I go, why would he write this? And had he, I thought, well, had he lost patience with the people that he's preaching to? I, I don't think that's it. Because he's been long-suffering throughout his time as a preacher of the gospel, he was long suffering with them and when he was teaching. So in order to understand this verse, really, I want us to take a closer look at it. Now, first of all, from this text, we learn something. We learn it's, it's just foolishness not to love the Lord. That's the first thing we learn from this verse. It's just foolishness not to love the Lord. Even though we do not know what Jesus looked like physically, uh, the four Gospels paint us a good picture of what he was like. And he healed the withered limbs. You ever thought about that much? I mean, he would take somebody's hand that we would consider handicapped today. We would, when there's nothing you can do. And he would take a withered hand, say, smaller than this hand, it's, it's withered, just like that. It was made, it was healed. It's, he had a perfect hand. That, listen, boy, if that don't make you sit up and take notice, I don't know what, well, I do know what will. He raised the dead. Um, he raised the men and one woman. So, you know, you look at this, and, and, and boy, it's just foolish not to. Uh, not only that, he could heal a, an insane mind. The mind would be just, the guy's crazy. I mean, he just, we would put him in a, somewhere. We wouldn't let him out on the streets, would we? But Jesus healed his mind just like that. And in a moment's notice, he did that. Um, there's a lot of them like that. Uh, let me tell you about, remember the deaf and the blind? Do you know how many nerves are in these ears and how many nerves are in these eyes that, where we can see 2020. Uh, I had one time I got uh, shingles. I had the shingles vaccine, both Beverly and I, and we both got the shingles. And the shingles started right here and worked around and went into my eye. And I can only have half the vision in this eye because it worked on that nerve that goes to your brain. Well, think about this. Think about all the nerves in the ears and the brain. And Jesus would take somebody who could not see. He would take somebody who could not hear. Just like that. All the nerves went back where they were supposed to. He put them all hooked together, all made them all perfect. And they had 20-20 vision, and they could hear a lot better than I do. I know that. So it's, it, it's amazing the things that he did. Um, he loosened the tongues of those who couldn't speak. Just like that. Just like you'd snap your fingers. He overcame the grip of death. He raised men and he raised uh, one girl uh, from the dead. They had been dead. They were miracles that, that nobody could deny. They were real. Right in front of your face. And so he was truly, truly the Son of God. He was truly the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings without a doubt. Jesus sacrificed for sins was also amazing. It was breathtaking. 
his sacrifice that he made for us, for the sins of the world. He came to earth. He gave up everything that he had. Now think about that. So we just pass over that sometime. But think about that. Where was his home? Is in a perfect place, wasn't it? It was in heaven. And he left that heavenly home and he came here and put up with us and left his heavenly home to come here. He left the glory of heaven and though he was rich, what did he become when he came here? Poor. He was rich and he became poor. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, whose sake? Our sake. For your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And oh, we're rich. Sometimes we don't think we are. I get the feeling sorry for myself. I want three cars and so Talon will have something and I'll have something and Jill have something. But well, we only had one for a long time we, and we had to make a decision to do something. But, you know, we want and we want and we want different things to try to make our life better. And that's nothing. That stuff's nothing. It's nothing. When you think of what he did for us, and what do we do for him, you know? What do we do every day for him? Do we live our life so that it brings glory to God? Do we live our life where somebody can look at us and tell we belong to Jesus Christ, that we're his children? It's a good question, isn't it, to think about. He took on himself flesh and blood. Listen, he didn't have flesh and blood, did he? He came from heaven, born of a virgin. A miracle, the first miracle. And then here he is on the earth. He took on flesh and blood like you and I. And he tells us what kind of an attitude we're to have. I want you to look at Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. He's going to show us some attitudes that, that we're to have as a Christian. You have to look close in it or, or you'll look over these things. In Philippians 2, beginning at verse 5, I'm going to read 5 through 11. He says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in who? Christ Jesus. So what's that tell us? What kind of an attitude are we to have? Christ-like attitude. We're to have a Christ-like attitude. Um, who, although he existed in the form of God, he was God. He did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He voluntarily did that. He voluntarily came to this earth. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. There's two more words for us as a Christian as an example for, for our life to be Christ-like. We're, we're to be humble in our life. And we're to be obedient to God, obedient to His commands in our life each day to do everything we can that, so we can have a home in heaven. And he goes, being humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason also... God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, those that are dead now, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's amazing, isn't it? what he did for us. I just, it's hard to grasp. It's hard to really fully understand he'd do that for us. He was a friend of those who had no friends. I want you to think about that. He was a friend of people that 
no other people would have friends with. They, they, they wouldn't be friends to them. I'm talking about a leper. Boy, if you saw a leper, boy, it, beware, beware. He's coming. You cover up, you run, you do whatever you need to do to get away from him. The widow, they didn't have government programs like we have today that would care for a widow, that someone, a doctor, a, a nurse, what is that called, home health, go to your house, take care of it, check your blood pressure, all this stuff, and see how you're doing. They didn't have nothing like that. She was on her own, a harlot. No one wanted to be around that. Everybody shunned that. A tax collector, he was hated more, I guess just as much as any of these others I've mentioned, uh, because a tax collector was a Jewish man that was working for the Romans to take their money and give to the Romans. You see why they hated him? They hated him. But Jesus was a friend to these who had no friends. Um, he was, uh, he, uh, he also went to the poor and people despised the poor. They didn't have any kind of program to help the poor. He was, uh, Jesus was despised and they were despised. The people that he uh, would, would be friends with, people who are despised, they, we didn't, they didn't have anything to do with them. The downtrodden, forget that. There was nothing to help them, and, and most of, of the Jews at that time, they'd just turn around and go the other way. The lowly, they didn't have nothing to do with the lowly. And guess what? He hung on the cross and died for them. He died for all of them, and he died for us. Amazing, isn't it, the love that he had? When he died on earth, on that cross, the earthquake, well, I bet it did. I bet if you'd have been there, you would have been, it would get your attention. The universe convulsed. He was buried in a barred tomb. He had to, bar, he had to be buried in a barred tomb. So, and, and it was a, a, a tomb of a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. So here he is. He had nothing. And he was buried with the rich in a rich tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But Joseph, he didn't, he got that back because Jesus only needed it three days and then, then it was empty. Uh, so the most amazing miracle of all happened. He rose from the dead and I'm so thankful for that. How many in here not thankful for that? Boy, we are all thankful for that, isn't it? Because he lives, we will live. Uh, he died for us. And in John chapter 11, beginning at verse 25, we all love these words. We all love these words. Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Hey, he had, his body had already started decomposing. It, he, there ain't no way you can put that back together, except Jesus can. Except he can. So Lazarus had been dead for four days. And in John chapter 11, verse 25 through 26, Martha, before this, right before this, Martha comes to Jesus and said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would have never died. She knew that. She knew. If he was sick and Jesus came, he'd be well. She knew he had the power to do that. But more than that, she really knows who he is. Because in, in John chapter 11, she tells him, or he, he, said, he says, your brother will rise again. And she said, well, I know he'll rise again on the resurrection. And then Jesus says these words to her. I, I, Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and life, he told Martha. He who believes in me will live. Even if he dies, he will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? We may die. We may die. We may do it. If the Lord don't come back first, we may die. <laughs> but that's not the end, is it? No, we just lay the body down and, and then we go on to a place of peace that the Lord has prepared for us. We don't ever die. And then when he comes back, he's going to give us a glorified body that's fit for heaven, that's made just specially for heaven. Uh, I look forward to that. So, 
whoever believes in, in me will never die. Never die. We will live. And because he lives, we'll live. It's really foolish then to not love Jesus Christ. Yet many in this world do, do not. Many in this world just do not. They totally reject him. I, I'll never understand that. The Jews did not. And they still, most of them do not. Uh, I, I know I watched this deal. I don't even remember what it was. It was a YouTube deal on Jerusalem. And uh, a Christian would ask this Jewish person if he had ever read Isaiah 53. He said, no, I, I never read that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, they, they, don't, they don't believe it either today. So I think millions and millions of people who ignore Jesus Christ today. Have, have you ever thought about that? How, how they just really, if you, if you could physically do it, you, they would push him out of the way. They would shut the door in his face. How many times that happened to you? How many times did, have you carried something to, to give a pamphlet to somebody to talk to them? And they shut the door in your face. Or if you're out somewhere and you're talking in a group and they just push you out of the way. They go on. They don't need that. Think of the millions that do that. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to so many in this world. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Well, I, want, I, should have, I should have told you one I forgot. John chapter 1 and verse 11. Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. Isn't that pitiful? And so 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. I'm going to read selected verses in those verses 18 through 25. I'm not going to read it all. I'm going to pick it out and I'll tell you where I am. Uh, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to someone who's lost in sin. 1 Corinthians 1, beginning verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, and that's you and I, is the power of God. Verse 21. For since the, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews' assembling block and to the Gentiles' foolishness. Look at verse 25. Because of the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Isn't that amazing? Because that is the absolute truth. Man thinks we, we think we're so smart. We think we have the answers to everything. God has the answers to everything. We think of millions who ignore Jesus Christ today, and it's sad. Uh, why do they do that? Why do they do that? Why do not more people obey and love Jesus Christ? You know the answer to that? You know, you and I don't know all the answers. We don't. But, but many... I, and I feel this way because they only love themselves. They, they, they think they're number one. And, and they only love themselves. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. I'm going to read 1 through 5. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Boy, and they have, haven't they? They have. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control brutal, haters of good, 
treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. They don't practice what they preach, do they? Avoid such men as these. You know, you look at that, and that's pretty plain to see, pretty easy to understand what he's trying to tell us there. In Matthew 6, and verse 5, I want you to look at what Jesus says. Matthew 6 and verse 5. And the reason I want you to look at Matthew 6 and verse 5, it, the one reason is today is because people sometimes love the praise of men more than the praise of God. They love the praise of men all day long more than they do God. Matthew 6 and verse 5. Jesus says, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. He's talk Who does he think he's talking to? He's talking to the Jewish leaders, the Jewish religious leaders. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, now this is Jesus' own words about his own people there. They have their reward in full what they're doing. They're, they're trying to bring attention to themselves. They want the praise of men uh, more than they want God, and they got their reward. There are many like Demas. Some people just leave. <laughs> they just want to go back to the world. They, they don't want to live a Christian life. That, that's just not what they want anymore. They'd rather give it up, and they'd rather suffer the consequences. That's hard to understand that, but there are some who do. And one of them we know about, Demas. Demas loved the world more. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, here's a man that had been with Jesus. He had been, now think of this, he had been with Jesus. What if you had been with Jesus? And uh, Did I say Jesus? I mean, he had been with Paul. I'm sorry. He had been with Paul. Think of what he saw with Paul. Think of all the things he saw Paul do. And here he is. Paul, he's going to leave Paul when Paul needs him the most. Paul is facing death. He's in prison. He's fixing to be killed because of his belief. And he needs people there to support him, to help him in every way he can. And look at this man, 2 Timothy 4.10. How would you like for your name to be recorded in God's Word forever. <laughs> forever. For Demas, having loved this present world, had deserted me, and that's Paul, and gone to Thessalonica. That's pretty pitiful, isn't it? Countless others, they just do not love the Lord. They don't appreciate anything that he did because they just do not know him. They do not know him Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they will not believe. If that's the way they want, then that's the way it'll be. Satan is out and about. He wants us. If he can get a Christian, oh, it makes his day. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 3 and 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. Satan had blinded the minds of unbelievers. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But even if our gospel is veiled, now watch, it is veiled to those who are what? Perishing. Perishing. They will never believe, and they're perishing, and it's veiled to them. They do not know him. They do not want to know him. And Satan likes it that way. He's blinded their minds. In whose case the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ who is in the image of God. That's pretty pitiful, isn't it? Millions also have never heard of him. They never heard of him. 
There's some people in this world had never heard of him. But others have heard of him. But they're deceived. They fall for the things that Satan creates. He's blinded the minds of the unbelieving. It, if a person was in serious trouble, and I want you to think about this. If a person was in serious trouble, let's say because he owned this debt that he owed so much that there was no way it could be paid. He would never pay it in his lifetime. And the creditors would be on him like a pack of wolves, wouldn't they? They would drive him crazy. Someone offered to help him, and what would happen if he tells that person, oh, I, I, I'm okay, I don't need your help. <laughs> That's what happens sometimes. People hear this, and all the sympathy ends. That's just the way it is. Let me give you another example. Have you ever heard of a drowning man not asking for help? Have you ever heard of that? I have never heard of that. I'll even give you a better example. Once in the military, we were doing these river crossing operations in these little bitty rubber boats. We we're going to cross this river. Boy, and it was flowing and it was deep and you'd make a bend in the curve at a curve in a river and there'd be brush piles and I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to fall out of this boat and I've got everything loaded down on me. I've got pack and I've got canteens and I've got my weapon. I've got everything. i got my boots and all of that. I didn't think I'd fall out. But as soon as we made the round in that curve of that boat, I fell out. And I'll never forget it. I'm not a good swimmer, but I can dog paddle all day long. All day long. I can swim on my back. <laughs> she laughs. But I, I can swim to, to Brenda. I can, I can do that, but then I wear out. Now, I can dog paddle all over the place. But I can't swim like Johnny Weismiller. And so I fell out, and I waste, with all that stuff, I weighed so much. And I never hit bottom, and I fought back up. And I come to the top, and there these guys are looking at me in the boat. They're expecting me to just grab a hold of the boat and come on in. And they watch me, and I go back down. And that brush pile's coming. I knew if I, if I got in that brush pile, I wasn't going to get out. And I kicked and kicked and kicked and kicked and fought back to the surface again. I got my head up above the water, and I'm looking at them. They're still looking at me, and I go, help. <laughs> help. <laughs> and they helped. <laughs> they, they jumped in. And, boosted me, just gave me enough support where I could get in that boat. I was so glad. The first thing I did was take off my boots and all my equipment, too. I took that off. I wasn't going to go any further like that. So sometime, I, sometime help is offered, and I've never heard of anybody not wanting help. Jesus Christ saves us if we'll just obey him, you know? If we just do what he says. If we just obey what he says to do. Um, Jesus paid the debt that we owe. And sometimes we don't think much about it. You know, we just kind of go through it. Yeah, he paid the debt, and, and I, I don't have much of a debt. And, you know, we just pass over it. But listen, we had the debt of sin on us. Adam and Eve... They sinned in the garden and were separated from God by sin. We're sinners. We were till we became a Christian. He paid the debt that we could have never paid. If only we'll accept him as our Savior. Isn't that amazing that people would, won't do that? He paid the debt, like the guy that owed the debt that I gave the example of. He paid the debt that we could never pay back. Millions have rejected him in salvation. John chapter 5, beginning at verse 40. John chapter 5, verse 40. Jesus touches on that. John chapter 5 and verse 40. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life and he's not talking about just life and that we live in this life. He's talking about eternal life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you 
that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. Oh boy, let's pray that we don't ever reach that point in our life. To refuse him is the most foolish thing that a person can ever do. It's like building your house on the sand. That was one of the reasons he gave us that example. He building your house on the sand, and, and, and what happened to it? It washed away. Uh, the storms in life come in our life. The storms in life, we have, we have them all the time. And if we don't have God in our life, and worst of all, besides not being able to face those storms, we're doomed to eternal nightmare. I guess the worst nightmare you can have is have the nightmare that you've been doomed. I've known people who had that nightmare and been scared to death, but it's probably pretty good to have that nightmare so it'll keep us on our, our toes. I can't think of anything for an eternally, eternally doomed. Uh, have you ever seen a starving man refuse food? Me neither. I sure don't. I feel like I'm starving all the time. Of course not. And all these are examples I'm trying to give you that we can understand. And so we can make an application to our own soul. Our soul is the only thing that we have that's eternal. It's the only thing we own that will never die. <laughs> it's eternal inside us. We're going to lay the body down. It's going to turn to dust but not our soul. The soul is the only thing that you and I own that's eternal. And it's amazing to me that anyone can refuse the help that Almighty God offers to refuse eternal life in heaven that He offers. We're to love Jesus Christ because He's our Redeemer. And we know how much He says. In Mark 12, and verse 30, Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God, how much? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Every bit of us are to love him that way. He prayed that price on the cross. Before the cross, they flogged him to, to the near death. The only reason they stopped flogging him is because they weren't supposed to kill him. He was up to that point, and then they nailed him to a cross put the crown of thorns on his head, ridiculed him, spit on him, all those things he did for us. Nails driven into his hands and feet on that cross. And why did he do it? To redeem you and I. To redeem us. What love he has for us. What he did for us, we can't ignore it. And we forget maybe that the Lord has feelings too. How do we know this? Because Hosea... Hosea in Scripture is talking about Israel, what they have done. In Hosea 11 and verse 8, Hosea 11 and verse 8, it says, My heart is turned over within me. With all my compassions are kindled. And we think we're just taking care of ourselves. The Apostle Paul says, Those that do not love him that we read right off are accursed. They're marked for destruction. And Jesus Christ is coming back to judge the world. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse 8, we see this. Verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse 8. Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God. To those who do not obey what? The gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. But you see, we know it doesn't have to be this way, don't we? We know it doesn't have to be this way. Jesus stands at the door of our hearts and He's always knocking. Revelations 3 and verse 20, He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come to him and I'll dine with him and he with me. 
But most of the time, many people in this world like pride. They like they they uh, let pride and anything else get in the way, and that's a terrible thing. So, like I said, Jesus came to this earth to save us because He's a Lamb of God. John chapter one verse twenty nine. The people in Samaria told the woman at the well who met Jesus and she left her pot and she run to town and she says, I've met the Messiah. And so they all go out there and in John 4 and verse 42, as they were standing, as they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves and know that this one, who's talking about Jesus, is indeed the Savior of the world. He's our high priest, and he's our king. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 17. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 17. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Hebrews 4, verse 16. Hebrews 4 and verse 16. He's talking to us here. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, we love Christ by our obedience to the gospel. And we love his plan to redeem us. And I know all of us here are Christians tonight. But, he's, but in Mark 16 and verse 16, Jesus tells us, he told the disciples, if you just believe in him and, and is baptized, you'll be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. It's what he told them to do, go out into all the world, all the creation. And then we know, all of us know in Acts 2, verse 38 and 39, at the day of Pentecost, that's exactly what they did. They preached the first gospel sermon. And then we know that once we become a, a child of God, Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27, he tells you and I, for we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So when we obey the gospel, he automatically added us to his church. We're born again, and we enter into the spiritual kingdom. He adds us automatically. So the questions we need to ask ourselves tonight, are you faithful in your life each day? Have you lost your focus on God in your life? If so, we need to come back to him. Jesus' last words are written for us on this earth. I come quickly. <laughs> I come quickly. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we ready for that day to come? We can help in any way. Won't you stand?